Test, test, test. Looks like, yep, test, test, test. Good. Yeah, there's a folder on there with the old from 2020. Okay, yeah. That was maybe the first time. Yeah, that's the first time. And then 22 and 24, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure how far the 22s, but the 20s are there anyway. Okay. All right. Oh, it is, and it's time. This is slow. Yeah, two, two now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Linda, good to see you. I'm well, and you? Yeah. Is Mark here or no? No, oh, okay. I know, I know, it's time. <laughs> Good morning, welcome.
Good morning, everyone. Test, test, test. I should hand out door prizes for who had to dig through the most snow this morning, huh? Well, welcome to the Cornerstone Lectures. I'm Pastor Quentin. I'll be your host and moderator today. And uh, it's a delight to have you here today as we look at the life of Joseph and as we think about the triumph of faith. We're so pleased to have Dr. Gabe Floor back out this time. This is Gabe's third time here, and we're delighted to invite Callie as well. It's been such a joy to spend time with them, to hear more about their lives and their ministry. Gabe's the uh, senior minister at First Presbyterian Church of Chattanooga, which uh, I'm familiar with because I used to worship there on occasion. One of my best friends was on staff there a long, long time ago. Uh, Amanda and I got engaged in that area, so fun connections there. Well, let me uh, walk through a couple of details today as we get started. Uh, they're all B's in terms of you know, my outline this morning, so if you're taking notes, bathrooms are in the back. Uh, ladies, especially in the hallway where the food is, there's a large bathroom at the end of that hallway. There's a single restroom, and just to the left of that, there's a large one. So if this one is full, you can find another one. Uh, guys, if you're really uh, pressed for a restroom upstairs, there's another large one too. But the main ones are right here behind you. Uh, our breaks will be according to schedule. You should have picked up uh, an outline or uh, a program on your way in. And so we'll just follow that pretty much uh, as it's written, unless something really changes. Uh, books. We've got a table of books. Many of you already have made your purchases, but we're thankful for Brian from Evangel Christian Stores to be here today providing those uh, for sale for you. Those are some of our major things uh, this morning, but I hope that today will be a blessing to you as we hear God's Word uh, from the book of Genesis as it brings uh, His Word to our lives, as it bears on our everyday lives, as it bears on the challenges we face, as it bears on our future in the next several months, as we trust Him, as our faith in Him and His promises, His goodness is what carries us through. Well, let's open in prayer and then we'll welcome Dr. Floor. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity, uh, despite the snow, to come, to gather together, to sit under the teaching of your word. Thank you for all those who have come today, those who are eager to feast on your word, the very words of life. Where else can we go? Father, we pray that today our hearts, our minds would be open to hear, to listen and yes, to believe. We pray for Gabe as he preaches, as he teaches, as he brings your word today, that you would equip him, uh, give him the, the passion for your word and the, the love for your people, we ask. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's welcome Dr. Gabe Floor. Thanks, brother. How long do I have? Uh, like 50 minutes? There's water here. Good morning. It's so good to be back here. I want to thank you all again. Thank you to the elders, to the pastors uh, for the hospitality. I was telling my wife on the way out here, you've just never been to a place like this. And so thank you. Thank you for having us. It's just such a joy to be here. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37 is where we'll begin this morning in the story of the life of Joseph. And we'll look at verses 2 through 11, so let me pray, and then we'll read those and hear God's Word. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here and to learn from the Word that you gave through Moses so long ago. Lord, teach us about what we need to learn. Most of all, hold up Jesus for us, we pray, and we ask it all in his mighty name, amen. Genesis 37, beginning at verse 2. This is God's word. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. 
He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, there were binding she- we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind, The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the living God will stand forever and ever. Amen. Here's here's what we're going to look at this morning and the, the next few hours. How do you keep your faith in the world that we live in? And I'm not just talking about the external circumstances. Um, I think we're all well appraised. We live in a fractured time. We live in an anxious time. And we also live in a time that that looks around and says, we got to get all we can right now because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so there's anxiety everywhere. That's what's outside of us. How about inside of us? We live in the most materially prosperous generation that has ever walked the face of the earth. I want you to stop and think about that. If you look at the history of the human race, right now if you're alive and sitting in this room and you're in the U.S., you're in the top 1% of humanity that has ever lived, and yet we have the biggest mental health crisis probably ever faced in Western culture in terms of just statistics. And so all around us, people are saying, well, what do we do? What does this gospel have to say to us? And then that maybe raises the question, why would we go to Genesis to learn about that? Why don't we just go right to the New Testament? Well, here we are at the end of this foundational book of the Bible. Now, here's a couple things to note about this, this text before we launch into it. The book of Genesis, some of you may know, the original Hebrew did not have chapters or verse numbers. Okay, so it's just... Hebrew text, this was all added later, about 500 years ago. So when Moses' original audience heard this, there were different textual markers to let them know where they were in the book besides chapter and verse numbers. And what you see in this book is what we read there at the beginning in verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. So Genesis is organized around 10 of those statements. These are the generations of. This is the last one. And Joseph's narrative occupies as much space in this book as the narrative of the life of Abraham. Now, if you're an ancient Jewish person reading this, you're going, okay, I need to sit up and pay attention if God is giving this much space to Joseph's narrative as he did to Abraham, the founder of the faith. Okay, so that's, what, that's why this is a, a, a good thing to understand at the outset. God is saying, pay attention to this. I have something to teach you from this text. And then if we were to turn to the New Testament and you were to read the genealogies in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, you're going to see characters from this story. And here's what's amazing. It's not the characters that we would put in the story for the life of the Messiah in the New Testament if we were trying to make up a religion. So let me say that as an aside right here. The story of the life of Joseph ought to be really encouraging to us on a number of levels, not the least of which is the fact that here is this family that God is going to use to preserve the ancient world, to bring the Messiah through their line, and they are really messed up, okay? My family likes to joke that, hey, we put the fun in dysfunctional. 
Uh, Joseph's family, not so much. Okay, this is a, a beat up group of people. And this is why I think, again, when people say to me, hey, how do you know the Bible's true? There's all kinds of arguments we can give. One of the best ones is to say, pick it up and read it. If you're making up a religion, you don't put stories like Genesis 37 to 50 in that book. And if you read the ancient literature of other cultures around the time that this was written, and you had like the great prince and king, which Abraham would be like, you wouldn't include these stories. And so here God gives us encouragement by showing us these people were not so different than us. And we need to understand that as we launch into this. Don't look at Joseph as some unachievable paradigm. That's not the point of this story, and you'll kill yourself trying to do that. What you should look at Joseph and his brothers at as is, is fellow travelers along the way. So that's just a little bit of the context of where we are. And here's what I want us to see from these verses this morning. God uses a broken family to display his amazing grace. That's what he's doing here. He's using a broken family to display his amazing grace. And we want to look at this text in three headings. Joseph, Joseph's brothers, and Joseph's Jesus. So Joseph, Joseph's brothers, and Joseph's Jesus. Okay, so back there to verse 3. Notice how it, it begins. Joseph's 17 years old. Okay, he is the epitome of kind of this cocky, um, really intolerable 17-year-old, you know, like most of us were when we were 17, okay? So this is what he is. He's a, he's a very entitled, privileged teenager. And by the way, if you go back and read in this book, when Abraham is going to be, uh, or Jacob is going to be reunited with Esau, if you read, there's a little textual detail there. I think it's in Genesis 35. Um, here, here's the thing that we should pay attention to there. When Jacob is getting ready to meet Esau, if you remember that story, he's really concerned about, hey, you know, I stole my brother's birthright, not kind of a cool thing to do, and my brother has a huge army with him, so things might not turn out well for me. So he, he, he does what Jacob loves to do, he, and all of us. He's being self-protective, and if you read that text, what does he do? He sends all of his other kids to the front and keeps Rachel and Joseph at the back. Do you think that the other brothers had forgotten that by this point? I don't think so. Because they understood, and everybody else understood, when you put them in the front, they are the human shields in case Esau does decide to come with military action. And what Joseph had learned and his brothers had learned was, my brothers are expendable, I am not. I am the one who matters, they do not. They, it's, uh, Jacob was saying to them, it's okay if you get taken out, long as I got Rachel. Okay? Now, again, this is why when you, if you were to look through like a Christian bookstore, as it were, in the time of Joseph, you wouldn't find a title uh, of a book called How to Win at Parenting by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? <laughs> this is why. Because here you see the sins of the, these generational sins in this family. And where did Jacob learn this from? From Isaac. Okay? So this, is, this has been passed down. It's not gotten any better. It will get better by the end of the story. But we need to understand that because when we read Joseph 17 and then he starts having these dreams, you can begin to think, because the, the text is pretty sparse, this is a crazy reaction that his brothers had to him. It's not at all. There's a family history here. And so when he comes and says to them, I've had these, dr these dreams, they are geared, hardwired after day after day, year after year, decade after decade, watching their brother getting spoiled. They're geared to go, I don't like this guy. So here, here's the Joseph we meet. And he seems to have been something of a tattletale. So we'll, we'll come to that. He brought a bad report. There's about one other time this Hebrew phrase is used in the Old Testament. It's when the spies go up to look at the land in Numbers and they bring back a bad report that discourages the people. And so there's a textual indicator here. This is not a good thing. It's not like Joseph's being this diligent son and trying to help his brothers out. No, he's, he's tattling on them. Okay, so he is not doing anything to win his brothers to himself. Why does this matter for us? 
Uh, even the best family in here, uh, you, you can have all the things. Um, kids are doing great. You're doing great. Life's kind of awesome. Everybody's going to have dysfunction in your family, okay? In marriage, in parenting, in how your kids do. And if you don't have it right now, I am not trying to be super depressing when I say this. It will come for you, okay? You are going to experience brokenness in relationships. Why? Because we're sinners, And one of the chief hallmarks of being a sinner is that you become selfish, especially with those closest to you. You The biggest problem in my marriage right now is it's not um, my kids and their busyness. It's not whatever Callie does, and she does a whole lot to make it not uh, um, something to stress me or anything at all. The biggest problem in my marriage is me. Okay, and it's for all of us in here. When you look at the the relational problems, what's our temptation? That person did this to me. Instead of going, you know, they may have have insulted you or said a harsh word or whatever it is, and we get super defensive, and the first thing God is saying to us is, look in the mirror. This is where a problem comes in. We are selfish. And that gets played out in the context of this family. We get a front row seat, and God is saying to us, Don't think you're any different. It will happen in our lives. That's why God includes these kind of stories for us. But here's the encouraging part. I I just am blown away every time I read this part of the Bible. Uh, All the way God's providence works, we're going to look at this. He brings this really dysfunctional family together to save the world. The ancient world, then to bring the Messiah through this family... And they are really messed up. And those are the kind of people God draws near to. What did Jesus say? I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And that's the problem we have here this morning. We all just tend to think we're pretty okay. We're pretty righteous. We're not. And that's what this story reminds us. Even in your worst moments, God is still saying, I can use that. And when you are selfish and spoiled and entitled, if that's how your heart reacts to your circumstances, God is saying, I don't give up on those kind of people. I work through even the worst kinds of of personal dysfunction and corporate dysfunction that we bring to the table. So that's Joseph. What about Joseph's brothers? Well, they've been raised up like Joseph had with uh, Jacob's house, they'd heard the stories of the covenant God. They knew, as it were, the scriptures of that time, which were the stories being passed down to them. They'd heard about what God would do, and they're totally lost at this point. We're going to see how bad they're lost as we work through this story. And they knew that dreams were vehicles for God's revelation, so they knew that that Joseph may have had a dream, but how do they respond to that? Now, Again, we've noticed Joseph's being pretty spoiled and, you know, entitled with them. But what should they have done? They should have said, this is our younger brother, and this is a pretty big deal that that he's saying he's had a dream, and we might want to sit and listen to him while also gently correcting him, because this is how all siblings react with each other, right, When, when things like this happen. No, they don't do that at all. They come and they say, are are you going to be a ruler over us? Who do you think you are? And, and again, get the context here. This would have been incredibly insulting in this culture, especially the second time around when he's talking about his dad. Remember how honored parents were in this culture. And so for Joseph to say, not only am I who's the last born going to be better than the first born, I'm actually going to be exalted even above my dad. That, that's like the ancient equivalent of saying to your family today, um, I am basically going to have all y'all working for me by the time I'm, you know, 25. That arrogance. That, and so they, they react to that. They knew all these stories. And think about Jacob's response, too. And, and this is where you see the brothers getting it from. Verse 10, what does Jacob say to them? His father rebuked him. So here's Jacob. And y'all, he's the guy who wrestled with God. 
He's seen God do great things. He's built altars to God. He's worshipped the Lord his whole life. Here's Jacob, and he's become spiritually insensitive. He's become spiritually insensitive. He doesn't discipline his other boys. He's not spiritually attuned to what God is doing. And he misses the whole thing. Again, how encouraging in one sense is that for us? Here's one of the patriarchs, met God, and still needs the gospel. Still needs to be reminded that God is going to work in ways in his life. Now, isn't this the way we totally, we, we think normally? Hey, if I'd had the experience Abraham had and wrestled with God, man, my spiritual life would pretty much be set to go for the rest of my days. And what we ought to notice is that's never the case in the Bible, in the history of redemption. When people meet God, it's not like that just fills their tank of God for the rest of their lives and they never doubt or have questions again or get spiritually insensitive. Jacob had all of that, and here he's just sliding back like we all are into our default setting. And so his brothers are following their dad's lead in terms of they learned this somewhere. They learned to react to their brother like this somewhere. And it probably came from Jacob. Now, here's, here's one of the questions for us as we think about this here this morning. If you've been raised around Christianity um, and you've been raised around the church or you've just kind of been in church for a long time, isn't the danger that it's really easy to hear about God without knowing him? It's really easy to, to be a, somebody, a young person growing up in the church. Now, it's a little bit different out here, okay? Um, the situation in Oregon is decidedly different than it is in Tennessee. You know, because everybody still goes to church in the South, right? I remember we had, we had a couple of new members join our church that had moved to, to, to Chattanooga from Colorado, and uh, they came to see me, and we were talking about it, and they were like, okay, we're just trying to figure out what people's angle is because they ask us our name, and then they ask where we go to church. <laughs> and we've never had people do that to us. We're <laughs> you know, growing up in Colorado. Uh, we just never had that happen. And my point is, there's, you know, wherever cultural setting we're in, there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of cultural Christianity and it, especially that affects us when we're younger. And, and that's what had happened in Jacob's family. They'd heard a whole lot about God, but they never any personal closing with him, as it were. They didn't own the covenant that God had presented for themselves. And my, one of my passions is, is that's none of us here this morning, that all of us have placed our faith in Christ and said, yes, this, this Savior is for me. And that's what Joseph's brothers hadn't done yet. They were lost. And here's the thing that, that we want to ask ourselves is, what does God do with lost people? Does, does he love us when we're lost? And I think what you see as you read this story, you read the parable of the prodigal son, is God loves to pursue the lost. And that's where he says to us as believers, this is my heart for people who are lost. Is it your heart? for people who are lost. Because one of the things that can happen as we get in church for a long time is we lose our sensitivity like Jacob did. We lose our sensitivity to what's going on in, in our own lives and we lose our sensitivity to the world around us. And one of the things that God is committed to is to say, I, I have this heart for people who are far from me and I will put that heart in my people to go pursue the people who are far from me. And that's one of the things that, that we can all be doing in our daily lives is say, Lord, bring me somebody who is far from you, like Joseph's brothers were, like so many people we know today are, that are living their lives the best they know how, totally out of accord with God's word, and, and making a wreck of things. And we don't swoop in with some self-righteous ju judgment. We do come in with the heart that God has for the lost and say, how, how can I serve this person? How can I bring them Jesus? Where do they need? How can I bring the, the gospel to them in their lostness? So there's, there's Joseph, there's his brothers, and then finally we come to Joseph's Jesus. So as we study together here, 
One of the, the threads we want to trace out of this story, and that I think God intends for us to trace out, is his sovereign purposes for everything that's going on in your life and in mine. Okay, so at the outset, he shows us through Joseph's dreams a number of different things. He says, the sun and the moon are going to bow down to you. Now, that's important biblical language because if you were to go to, say, the book of Revelation chapter 12, you'd read about the sun and the moon and the stars right out of this vision. Okay, and what it was, what's the picture there? The Messiah and his birth, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. That's what Revelation 12 is about as it tells that story of redemption in miniature. So this is going to come up later, and that's why we need to pay attention to it now in the Bible. God is giving Joseph these visions, not just for himself, not just for his family, but to be recorded to show us the way of salvation, to show us the way of Jesus. And so that's why, as we're going to see, this is going to be costly for everybody involved. Joseph's dreams are going to cost him his freedom, his standing, uh, we're going to see this thread of how the clothing of Joseph weaves itself throughout all of this narrative. It's going to be costly to Jacob. Just like his forefathers before him, he is going to have to leave the land of promise. He's going to have to leave the place he loves. It's costly for Pharaoh's house, isn't it? These dreams, this dreamer... It's a mercy of the Lord to give Pharaoh a warning about the famine that's coming, but it's also going to be part of the purposes of God to bring this ancient world together to preserve this family so that Jesus can be born thousands of years later. We have to keep all of these things in mind. And, and the, the central point of it is this. The providence of God, my friends, the way he sovereignly governs your life and mine. Have you thought about that? Have you stopped to think about why you're here in Medford, Oregon this morning on a snowy March day, okay? Maybe you've lived here your whole life, maybe you're new, whatever it is. Have you stopped just to look back and recount the ways God has protected you, loved you, brought you to where you are? Isn't it something to, to think about how he's done with the circumstances of our lives so varied, so various, and yet we see this same hand of God working all the time, working all things to good for those who love him. There are few things that will encourage our faith like understanding God's sovereign providence over every aspect of your life. We're going to talk about that more in a later session. And then we want to look at, as we think about Joseph's Jesus and the cost to everybody involved, that as Jesus presents himself to us here, Joseph was always serving a plan far greater than his generation. The story of Joseph turns on this central fact which is introduced in this text before us. He was what at the outset here? The favored son who becomes the despised son and who is despised by his brothers because he was the focus of God's revelation and doesn't that turn your mind immediately to say John 1, verses 1 through 18? He came to his own, and his own received him not. Or John 2, but Jesus was not entrusting himself to any of those Israelite countrymen because he knew what was in man. And just like Joseph was this favored son, Jesus is the favored son who becomes the despised son. And here's the cardinal difference, though, between the two of them. Joseph's mouth and his attitude, in one sense, got him in this position. It doesn't make it just or right what his brothers are going to do to him. But you see like Joseph's own sin patterns. We don't ever see that with Jesus, do we? He was the favored son who became the despised son for us. That was the purpose he came. The purpose for which he came. He left that favored status because, again, in the providence of God, he knew you and I would never willingly do that. We don't like giving up any kind of favor that we have. And we certainly don't want to entrust our lives to one who was despised by men, rejected by men. 
And yet that's who Jesus was, and that's why he came, and that's the purpose of this story in the Bible to remind us if we are wanting an easy life, a costless discipleship, or an easy Jesus, that's not what we're going to find. We're going to find that life is difficult. The circumstances of our lives are hard. But the greatest news ever is that Jesus is so easy in how he treats us, so good to us. He's gentle and lowly, he tells us. He's kind. And so this favored son who had everything leaves it all to take your sin upon himself and become despised by the world in your place. And he has the the favor of his father turned away from him so that you and I would never know the father's favor turned away from us. Here's what we're learning here right at the outset. The favor that that Jesus receives from his father is not sinful favoritism, is it? No, it's the delight that the father has in the son from all eternity and the spirit together with them. What did Jesus tell his early disciples? I always do what pleases my father. None of us can say that. Only Jesus can say that. He always does what pleases his father. And yet, The father is going to, as it were, turn his face away from the son on the cross because of you and me. Because one of the things that we can do is begin to think that we're more like Joseph in this story. And what we have to realize at the outset is you and I are the brothers in this story. We're the ones who are more like the brothers than we are like the favored son. And that's why we need the favored son to help us and save us from ourselves. We also learn here that this is a, another chapter in a costly gospel. This is, this is what's just still, I think, so unfathomable for people. And, and we can say it all the time and kind of nod in agreement and yet not, not get it, how amazing it is that the gospel tells us that it cost Jesus everything, everything. To take your sin and my sin upon himself. To pay the atoning price for that sin. And it costs you and I exactly nothing except everything. And what I mean by that is this. It costs you, you you come and you place your faith in Jesus. And even the Spirit does that. It's a sovereign salvation from start to finish. And, And you and I don't have to contribute our own suffering We don't have to contribute our own standing. We don't have to contribute our own doing. It's all of grace from start to finish. And yet Jesus says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. So it costs us everything, even as it costs us, as it were, nothing. And all of that because Jesus was willing to become the despised son so that you and I would never be despised. That's really good news. Let me say just a a couple of things in closing on this part at least. Um, if, if If you're a Christian parent here today, it's really easy to get discouraged, isn't it? Uh, and if you're not a Christian parent, it's really easy to get discouraged. But particularly, you, you know, and if you're somebody as a covenant child or a child raised in a believing home, um, let's just have some real talk here. Your parents are going to make huge mistakes. Okay, all parents do. And, you know, accepting like things like abuse or these, you know, kind of horrible things that can happen in family situations, kind of the normal day-to-day wear and tear on a family, we've got to have this perspective in mind, both as parents and as children. If you're a child growing up in a Christian home, your parents are going to blow it. <clears throat> and I just remember um, when I was about 18, my mom said to me, you know, honey, you ought to write a book right now while you still know everything, right? <laughs> And as, you, as your parents get older, you start to see, as you get older, you look, wow, there's a whole lot of wisdom there, right? <laughs> I, every time I see my dad, I'm like, I'm really sorry for everything I did growing up, dad, you know? <laughs> uh, if you're, a, if you're a, a child in a Christian home, give your parents a lot of grace, okay? That's why Paul spends time giving us instructions about this, the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians, all over the place in the New Testament. And if you're a Christian parent here, 
this morning. How are we parenting our children? What are the sin patterns we're imparting to them? Isn't that one of the most convicting things to ask? It's kind of like um, we've got teenagers now, which is just a whole new thing. Uh, as you all know, if you've raised teenagers, it's just, okay, just lace them up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. And as you're raising teenagers, you, you sit there and you look at, and you see them do something and you go, where in the world did they learn that? And then you realize, oh, me, that's where they learned it, okay? We're all going to have this dynamic because of the brokenness of sin and rebellion in our own hearts and in this world. And here's what, what God is warning against here. He says, if you're a Christian child, Christian parent, do not let grace become ordinary, either in your day-to-day experience or what you're teaching your children. Do not let grace become ordinary. It's amazing that he saves any of us. It's amazing that he loves us, his patience with us. And as we look at like the sin patterns we may have unintentionally imparted to our kids, and that we're seeing play out in their lives, do we realize, and if you're somebody who's like, yeah, I didn't ask for this home I was born into, and it's been rough, it's been hard, are we the kind of people who are going to Jesus saying, yes, but you are greater than my circumstances, you're greater than my past, you're greater than whatever uh, baggage and junk I've got, and you can take that and make it into something beautiful. That's the hallmark of Joseph's story. Is taking what's broken and making it beautiful. And that's what he can do for you. That's why God put this here, to encourage us. The Savior we follow, who is the favored son who became the despised son and is exalted now at the right hand of God, he is the one who says, I love you enough to keep working to bring you to the place I need you to be. I will work in the midst of all of your sin, all of your failure, all of your rebellion." And I will bring you exactly where I want you. So, as we finish up here in this first session, um, let's, just, let's just think a little bit more about hope. Hope that, that Jesus gives us. The love and grace that he shows us ought to engender hope in our lives. Okay, where, where have you lost hope? And hope is what's going to get you out of bed in the morning. Uh, Whether you are hoping in, you know, I want to get high, or you're hoping in Jesus, uh, everybody's got hope, whether you're a Christian or not. And you're saying, this is what's going to make me happy, this is what's going to make me satisfied, this is what's going to make me fulfilled, It's it's going to make me swing my legs out from the bed and put my two feet on the floor in the morning. And when we read this story and we realize who Jesus is, it's like, this is the only way to hope, my friend. And look around us. This is a hopeless time. And, and when we lose hope in the true and living God, we will become just like Jacob had become, the self-protective, self-hoarding individuals who are only concerned with saying, <clears throat> I can find this little bit of earthly security right now, and that will be my hope. And Jesus is always drawing us away from that, my friends. He's always bringing us back to saying, you need to open your tight-fisted hands and release everything to me. And I promise you I will take care of you. And I promise you I will be enough for you. And I promise you that you will never have misplaced hope if your faith is in me. That's what Jesus says to us. That's why he issues that invitation that comes from the book of Isaiah. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And in a hopeless time, wouldn't it be nice to get your shoulders out of your ears and rest and know that Jesus is sure and certain and everything he tells us is going to be sure and certain. And as the book of Isaiah repeats again and again, those who hope in the Lord will never be put to shame. You'll never have to deal with the eternal shame of being rejected by God. But any shame you feel, Jesus will deal with. So, Joseph's family introduction reminds us that all the good things in this life, all the things that we can count on and hope in can mask deep dysfunction in our lives. 
But his, his story also shows us that the gospel is made for broken, dysfunctional people. That's its design. And when you realize, when I realize, that I'm more like the brothers in this story than I am like Joseph, that gospel for broken, dysfunctional people becomes all the more glorious. And the Jesus that Joseph followed, as we'll see, the Jesus that, Jesus that his brothers learned to follow, the Jesus that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob looked forward to by faith and by anticipation, that same Jesus is available to us. He, that same Jesus will work in the same way in our lives as he did in these lives. All we have to do is know and admit that we're the brothers and not the favored son to get all the blessings of the favored son. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this story and for the way that you put it together to give us hope. Thank you for the life of your servant Joseph. Thank you that it's true, Lord. What a wonderful thing it is to have a reliable word from you in our Bibles this morning. Oh, Lord, help us. We're all hurting we're all struggling with things in different ways. And what we need right now this morning is the balm of the gospel. So give it to us, we pray, and lift up Jesus. For the rest of our time, we ask in his name, amen. Thanks so much, Dr. Floor, for opening that up to us and setting the stage for the rest of the day. We've got some time now for our first break. Uh, you're welcome to mingle, buy some books, drink some more coffee, uh, find the restrooms in the back, and uh, we'll be back here at 10 o'clock. Restore what was lost on the way, and be thou my hope in the waiting, in the silence I cry.
I cry out your name, your holy name. joy, O oh, bright heaven, sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befalls, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all, still be my vision in the darkness, restore lost on the way and be thou my hope in the waiting in the silence I cry out your name your holy name Jesus still
All right, welcome back, y'all. We're going to be in Genesis 40 for this session, Genesis chapter 40 and verses 1 to 23. And again, before we hear God's word, let's pray together. Lord, once again, be gracious to us and feed us with the bread from heaven, even Jesus our Lord, through the word of life, we pray for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 40, beginning at verse 1, this is God's inspired and therefore an errant word. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody, and one night they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please, tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on that vine there were three branches. And as soon as it budded, its its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cup bearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream, and there were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation, the three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Thus ends the reading of God's word. May he add his blessing to it. So as we come to this part of Joseph's story, we've skipped ahead in the narrative um, probably about a decade. If you read Genesis 38, the story of Judah and Tamar, that gives you a kind of an aside that Moses gives us there of about 20 to 23 years is what the the scope of Genesis 38 is. It's an interlude, and then you pick it up here, and we're working chronologically so that by the time we get to Genesis 41, um, Joseph's been in Egypt probably about 20 years, okay? And at this point, we're looking like, you know, 10 to 13 Three of them have been spent in prison by this point, okay? Now think about this. If you remember the story, if you haven't read it, here's what happens. Joseph goes out to his brothers at the latter part of 37. He says, um, hey, dad needs you. 
And they're like, hey, we're going to sell you into slavery. First, we're going to try to kill you. Then we'll have a better idea to make some money instead of killing you. So they send him into slavery. He goes down to Egypt. He gets bought by the most, second most important guy in the world. He gets brought to his house, Potiphar. Potiphar's wife is an adulteress. She casts eyes on Joseph. And then she lies about him, and he finds himself in prison. Uh, he's been there probably about three years now when we meet him in this prison. And as I was thinking about this, um, my wife and I were just talking, we were meeting some other folks here who are nurse practitioners, that's what she does, and when she was in grad school, I just remember, she would just like tell me, hey, sweetie, look at what God does in our bodies, aren't they incredible? Like, and you stop and think about it, it's one of the ways God reveals himself to us is the way he designed our bodies. And here's some interesting things about our bodies. We can survive for just two to three minutes without air, unless you're trained in, the, I think the world record's 11 minutes holding your breath. Um, I'm pretty sure my littlest, my youngest was getting ready to cry. She could hold it for like probably around that time before she let it out. So maybe I challenge that world record. Um, and we can survive just 10 minutes, humans can, at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we can endure 30 minutes of exposure to 40 degree water. And we can survive up to seven days without water. That's very unusual. Most it's about three. And only about 45 days without food. So our bodies are amazing, but they're limited, and we can stretch them to the breaking point. And that's the same way with our faith. That's why I wanted to use that illustration here, because Joseph's faith would have been immensely tested by this point. Because he gets those dreams in Genesis 37, and then it's like God goes radio silent on him. And he knew what had happened. He knew God had met with him. And now he's in this prison. And that last verse, verse 23, he's forgotten again. And how easy it would have been for Joseph to give up on God, even before this. Hey, God, you gave me these dreams, and then I was sold into slavery, lied about, falsely accused, imprisoned. How does he keep going, and how does it teach us to keep going? And here's what I want us to see. When, when hope seems dead, faith serves, faith trusts God's sovereignty, and faith hopes in God's providence. So that's what happens when you feel like there's no hope. Joseph gives us this roadmap here. It, it serves. Faith serves. Faith trusts God's sovereignty, and faith hopes in God's providence. And those will be our points here from this text. And as one commentator put it, when we get to this part of Joseph's story, it's about the same old suffering that continues on long after we think it should be over. Okay, so he's still in prison, and maybe that feels like something in your life. Like, when's this trial going to be over? It feels like it should be over, have been over a long time ago. Why do I keep going through this? Why doesn't God just take away this trial? That's where we're going to lean into this morning. So first of all, faith serves in verses 6 and 7. Here's what happens when we suffer most of the time. When we suffer physically, emotionally, spiritually, it makes us myopic, okay, and it makes us selfish, right? Because most of the time when we suffer, we are just concentrating on the pain stopping. That's not a bad thing, okay? You, uh, you know, you bump your elbow really hard into something and it starts to bruise, you want to get pain relief. That's not a bad thing. But I'm talking about the long-term suffering, whether physical, spiritual, or emotional. It can, be, it can begin to make us selfish. And notice what happens with Joseph here right at the outset. We notice that he's already begun to change by God's grace. Okay, so when we met him, he's this arrogant, entitled teenager. Now he's in his, let's call it late 20s or so, and he's, he's a guy who's been rotting in a prison, as it were, and he's looking for opportunities to serve. Okay, so he's listening to these guys talk about their dreams, and what could he have done? He could have been like, dreams? Let me tell you what happens when you dream. You end up here. He doesn't do that. He's looking for opportunities to serve. Instead of, self, instead of suffering making him selfish, it made him more God-centered. Okay? And that's uh, one of our pastors in Chattanooga likes to say it like this. You know, if we, if we run from the school of suffering that God puts us in, 
he will re-enroll us. <laughs> he will re-enroll us until we learn that lesson. And Joseph didn't need that re-enrollment. It's making him more God-centered. He's paying attention to the distress of those around him. And that reminds us that, that suffering, my friends, your personal allotted suffering that God has entrusted to you and to me, those personal hardships, those difficulties, they become a form of evangelism in our lives. Okay? We all know when you talk to anybody, whether they're a Christian or not a Christian, everybody's hurting. Everybody's got just bad stuff going on. And people are looking for anything for relief. And when we can begin to hold on to the Lord, to hold on to Jesus when suffering is getting after us and tearing up our own hearts and it makes us more God-centered like it did for Joseph, that is, a, that is going to be incredibly powerful in terms of witness to people. That this gospel is real, that it makes a difference, that it will change us as we follow Jesus our difficult providences are meant to make us more like Jesus so that we can make more followers of Jesus. Okay? That's one of the things God's entrusting our suffering with us for. It's meant to make us more like Jesus to make more followers of Jesus. That was Joseph's mindset. Now, think about his mindset for a second. We've said it's, it's not selfish, it's God-centered Every day he's sitting in this prison, there's no prospect of, of freedom. There's no justice system here. There's no appeal court. There's nothing like that. He's sitting there, no prospect for freedom. He's been falsely accused of rape by one of the most powerful women in this country. And he felt like his dreams were the stuff of archaeology by this point. You know, that's something they're going to dig up later. They're, they're, they're dead and buried. And yet... Notice what he does. I think most of us would complain, turn bitter. Isn't that what happens when we don't get our way? Or when life doesn't go according to our plan? Isn't it so easy to just grumble and complain and get bitter? And Joseph doesn't do that. He becomes the kind of person I think all of us want to be when hardship strikes. And that's calm, steady, trusting the Lord, continuing on in joy. And, and we have to ask ourselves, how do we become those kind of people? How did Joseph become that kind of person? He didn't waste his suffering, friends. He didn't let it become something to, that made him bitter and angry and complaining. He's begun to learn to trust the Lord in the middle of the circumstances that he never asked for. So we have to, if we're following Jesus here, we have to take the temptation of selfish suffering and turn it into God-centered joy. And that God-centered joy works for the good of others. That's one of the reasons we're giving, given the stewardship of suffering in our lives. Is, is God saying to us, I I'm going to use this in a way that, that you don't even fathom right now. But you have to trust me. So faith serves, but then faith... Faith trusts God's sovereignty there in verse 8. Now, notice the irony here. The dreams are what Joseph got, got Joseph into this trouble, and dreams are what's going to get him out of prison. They got him there, and they're going to get him out. And so the temptation now for Joseph at this point would be to be cynical. And as one author put it, cynicism seems so natural today <clears throat> because of the failure of the promises of liberalism. And I mean liberalism in a broad sense, not like just the political party sense, but this dream of you know, rationalistic, humanistic, enlightenment thinking that mankind can solve all of his problems and man is the measure of all things. And we all know that's just a failure. And there were so many promises from that that have not been kept that people become cynical. And what's the cynic's posture? What is, what's the cynical attitude we see around us today? Um, just notice now how, how a movie will get absolutely defamed if it's got a happy ending, okay? And, and Hollywood still hasn't learned the lesson, have they, right? Because you look at what happened with Top Gun Maverick, okay? Just a basic movie, action, happy ending, it blew the box office apart, okay? Because people are desperate to know, hey, 
And we're built this way, I think, by God to have stories that are not cynical. But you look at most TV shows, you listen to most songs, everything's cynical now because dreams are dead. And, and our society is cynical, saying, you know what, I'm not going to get fooled by that. And it's this posture of being aloof. And if that's your posture about religion, about Christianity, then, then Jesus is not ever going to make any sense to you. And what we have to realize is the self-defeating nature of cynicism. It postures itself as knowing better than like everybody else, so I'm not going to get fooled by that. Except it's being fooled by a worldview that's dying. That's the self-defeating nature of it. We all know the promises that led to cynicism don't work, and yet people are still trying them. People are still saying, no, I, I can do this life on my own. And notice what Joseph doesn't do here. He does not become a cynic. And, and here's the reason why, I think. Most of us become cynical when our dreams die. And that's kind of the, uh, the trajectory that a lot of people see their life on. Like, I had all these dreams when I was a kid. Uh, I thought about all these great things I was going to do. Now they haven't come to pass. And what do I do with my life? And God probably doesn't love me. And it's not worth going on. And these kind of things. And, and what does Joseph do instead? His dreams were never about him. Okay? That's one of the things even early on he realized. Most of us become cynical and bitter because our dreams are about us. As one author put it, who fantasizes about people saying no to them? Right? I mean, when you think about like your world and your daydreams, everybody does what you want them to do. And we become little sovereigns in our, in our dreams. And that's not what happened to Joseph. That's why I think he's not cynical here. He, he understands that the desire to be a little sovereign and to build our tiny little kingdoms is always on a collision course with the true and living God who is building his kingdom, who is always sovereign, and who's always going to win. And so Joseph understands that, and he says, uh, he, he does what we don't do. He ditches any kind of false ideas about God. And then he says, this is the God I'm going to trust in. This is the only one who matters. And so as, as he's doing this, and he says to them, look there at verse 8. Let me turn back there here, my own translation. He says, we have had these dreams, and Joseph says, do not interpretations belong to God. See, as he serves, he trusts what God is going to do. Now, just think about that statement, friend. Do not interpretations belong to God? Why would he still be saying that? Wouldn't it be natural for him to go, no, they don't, and that's why I, you know, am here. But no, he gives God all the glory, and he's saying there's only one sovereign, only one God who can interpret these dreams for us. Now, this would have been shocking to these two officials, okay? In Egyptian religion at this time, plenty of texts and archaeology have been done on this, uh, interpreting dreams was a lucrative business, as one author put it. It was, it was very lucrative for them to know what to do. And so they're puzzled and confused, and they hear Joseph talking about this one God. And he sees an opportunity, does Joseph, to glorify God among people who don't know him. And, and using what his own stewarding of his suffering to bless these other people would at the same time show them who God really is. Now, the only way you get there, my friends, of having this calm, steady faith when trials come, is if you and I are grounded, as we mentioned in the last segment, in the absolute sovereignty of God. And it's so easy to, to grasp this doctrinally. And I, I teach systematic theology, so I love doctrine. Do not hear me like downplaying that at all. We should all love doctrine because everybody in here is living out some kind of doctrine. Okay, but... When it just is doctrinal and we can repeat it and we can argue about it, then God is going to test us to see if we really believe it. That he's absolutely sovereign. Um, 
working on a project right now and was reading a book by an, an open theist author. Open theism is the teaching that God is not absolutely sovereign, that um, in order for us to be fully human, I'm trying to give a nutshell here, there's a whole lot more to it, but in order to be fully human, uh, we have to have free will that can override God's sovereignty. So the title of the book that I was reading about God's sovereignty and suffering was called God Can't. And the thesis of that, that book is there's some things God can't do uh, because of his voluntary limitation to enable us to have more free will. And as I read through it, this guy gave these poignant examples of people who had just suffered horrible things. And he said, you know, if you were to tell them that God is sovereign, what did he say? I would never worship a God who is a monster like that. Okay? And that, that's a pretty common view. And I think the temptation would be if you believe in God's absolute sovereignty is to go, those silly people. <laughs> you know, but if you step back and think about it, it is easy to understand in one sense where this author is coming from. I think he's totally wrong. And as an aside, when I was reading through all these examples he gave of just horrible suffering that people had endured, um, I, I was thinking to myself, well, yeah, but I could also, over 20 years of ministry, tell you a lot of stories of people who've had terrible things happen that have continued to trust the Lord. And that's what he didn't give you, is the other side of the story there. And I thought it was pretty disingenuous of how he was writing. And all that to say, when we say we believe in the sovereignty of God, he is going to test that. Not because he, he's trying to like play with us or toy with us. It's because he knows to get us where he needs us to be, it, it's not only going to come through the easy parts of our lives. In fact, I would venture to say that most of us can resonate with the statement of John Piper who said, which one of us says, I have learned the most about God on the sunny days, right? Nobody says that. It's when things get really hard that we're going to learn what we really believe about God. And when you look at somebody who's suffered well and still following Jesus and still has joy, you can depend upon this, that person has drunk deeply from the wells of God's sovereignty, not simply at a level that is content to rest in, here is the truth, and that's it, and I'm going to leave it there, but somebody who's drunk it into their very marrow of their souls. And if you want that, and we want to be like that, here's the hardest prayer to pray. Lord, do whatever it takes to get me there. Do whatever it takes to give me that kind of faith and trust. So this God who Joseph says interpretations belong to is the sovereign God he's trusting in, and he uses this as a time of evangelism. So faith serves, faith trusts God's sovereignty, and then faith trusts God's providence, 14 and 15. Joseph embodies Philippians 4.11, doesn't he? I've learned in whatever circumstances I find myself to be content. That's what Paul said. Okay, can we all just agree that that's really hard to say? I mean, how many of us can truly say that with Paul? I've learned that whatever circumstances I find myself in, I have learned the secret of contentment. Imagine if you published a book with that title, The Secret of Contentment by Joseph. Okay? And, and, and the word got out, and it goes viral, and people go, oh, wow, here's the secret. I think they'd find it be pretty mundane. Here's what Joseph and Paul would say to us. The secret of learning this contentment is trusting this sovereign God in his providence. Joseph was content with his circumstances because he saw God's guiding hand over all of them. And what we want to avoid, as we've seen cynicism, but also fatalism, What's fatalism? Fatalism is the belief, you know, summarized by it, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Fatalism is the view that our choices don't matter, we don't have any um, uh, real responsibility over our actions because after all, God is totally sovereign and he's preordained whatever comes to pass and therefore we are not responsible. And that's not at all what the Bible teaches, is it? And just one verse will illustrate that. I think the best verse to illustrate this um, tension of God's sovereignty and our responsibility, Acts 2.23. 
This Jesus of Nazareth, Peter says, well attested to you by signs and miracles done among you. And he was delivered over to you by the predestining, translating of the Gabe International Version here, the hand of God and his foreknowledge. You slew, you wicked men slew by your own hands. Okay, do you see what he's saying there? uh, Preordained, predestined counsel that God said Christ is going to die on the cross, and Peter emphasizes that, and then he says, you crucified him. And you can imagine some of Peter's audience may be going, well, which one is it, Peter? And Peter's saying to them, yes. That's the same thing we learn here from Joseph's life. He had learned this lesson. He had learned that God's providence didn't make him a cynic, and then didn't make him a fatalist. He is still going to say, hey, God brought these two guys into my life. Remember me when you get out of here. He's going to use this for an advantage to try to get out of that prison. He's not just saying, well, I should be content living in prison for the rest of my life. No, he says, God's sovereign, and he might just use these guys to get me out of this jail cell. And here's where it gets really interesting, I think. Um... Think about the the cup baker or the, uh, the, the cup bearer and the baker. I mean, imagine if you're the baker, you get you hear the cup bearer get this really favorable interpretation, and you're thinking to yourself, Joseph's a bona fide bona fide expert. He's the guy. So you go to him, and he says, uh, "You're going to die in three days." Okay. So maybe you go, "Man, I'm, I don't think I like him too much." So all of it comes to pass, which by the way shows us that Joseph's a true prophet. That test is going to be there in Deuteronomy 12. Hasn't, Moses has already written that, but the people of Israel haven't read it yet. And so that's coming up. Here's a foreshadowing of that te- uh, test for a false prophet. Does what he say come to pass? Joseph does, and it does come to pass. But then you think about these two officers here, and they get released. These were men who had had a high position. They were some of the most important people in Pharaoh's court. They'd been in prison. Do you think they wanted to get out of there? Okay. Yes. And what do they do? They do what most of us think, I think, would do when we got out of a situation like that. They were so happy to be out of prison, they would have said anything to get out of there. And the first thing they do is forget what they said they were going to do. Remember, Joseph says, just remember me, and they're, they're, I'm sure after he gave this interpretation of the cupbearer, he was like, bro, I got you. As soon as I get into Pharaoh's court, matter of fact, as soon as I'm shaved and cleaned up, I'm going to get you out of here. You can count on me. And none of that happens. Joseph is forgotten by men, forgotten by God, left by himself in this prison. And so again, I think this story gives us the biblical story in miniature. Now, Hundreds of years after this, God's people waited, waited for a long time to be released from slavery. God's people waited for 400 years after Malachi's prophecy before God gave them another word that came to them in the gospel. And when we think about our own lives, we can depend upon the fact that God is going to have us wait And just think about how many times you see that in the Bible. Wait on the Lord. And and one of the hardest things about waiting that Joseph learned here, that we're going to have to learn, is that waiting is a whole lot easier when you know it's going to be over and you know the purpose for it. And God rarely gives us either one of those things in our lives, does he? No, he puts us in situations that will bewilder us, in order that we stop our wretched self-savior attitudes. Have you noticed that in your heart? And this is so hard for us in America not to do. Because everything around us is like, hey man, you find yourself in a bad position, you do whatever it takes to get out of it. You pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And God is going to break that attitude in us, friends. And when he brings us to a place of waiting, he rarely tells us when it's going to be over, and he rarely shows us what, why we're there. Instead, he's saying, when the lights go out, will you still hold my hand, even when you don't see where I'm leading you? That's what Joseph learned. He learned that his father's hand was strong enough to guide him, 
even in the times of waiting. Now, why is this like the biblical story in miniature? Think about, just think about for a second, Jesus' life. Uh, we were at this great used bookstore in Chattanooga called McKay's. It's like 10,000 square feet of used books and records. So it's a happy place. And uh, we took our girls there, and I, went, I always go to the religion section, and there was a book by a, a scholar about why Jesus actually wasn't crucified and all the typical kind of conspiracy theory stuff. And I was thumbing through it, and he had all these neat pictures, and most of them were absolutely non sequiturs to his argument, but they were cool pictures. And reading through it, you know, Jesus, his hypothesis was Jesus was in Egypt and learning all these things and to do tricks and miracles, and that's why the Gospels aren't true, blah, 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 blah. Why do people write books like that? Or, you know, you, you all, some of you all may remember the Da Vinci Code, okay, that kind of thing, these conspiracy theories, the Passover plot, all of these things. Why do people write books like that? Because the truth is far too mundane for them. They think about somebody like Jesus who has shaped world history, and they go, there's got to be more to it. And the gospel accounts are pretty simple, aren't they? It tells us that Jesus, Jesus worked with his hands. And, and we think, like, the way we write modern biographies, uh, I'm just finishing a biography of Samuel Adams, who, by the way, was an amazing figure in American history and a good Presbyterian, so there's that. Um, that's a freebie. Um, so... Reading that, and, and what do you do when you read a modern biography? You, you pick it up and you expect, like, minute details. And this, was, this scholar had won a Pulitzer who's writing on Samuel Adams, and she's going through, like, here's what happened on December 28th, 1752 in Samuel Adams' life. And we map that onto the Gospels and go, where was Jesus for 30 years? And that's what scholars do as well. They're like, this can't be all there is to it. But Ancient biography is not the same as modern biography, is it? And the, ancient, the authors here of the Gospels, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why don't they pay a lot of attention to Jesus' early life? Because they want to tell you the story about what he did for you. And so they leave off some of those details. What they do give us is this. Jesus lived in obscurity with his earthly parents, working, we often translate the word as a carpenter, probably means something more like a general contractor. That's what Joseph was. And so for 30 years, I want you to think about this. Jesus was a blue-collar worker, as it were. I don't like that term, really, because it, it makes a, a false distinction. My, my grandfather was an iron worker his whole life. Uh, never went to college, fought World War II, U.S. Marine, still one of my heroes. Um, and he, he always was building something. But one of the things you notice about people who work like that is I can remember my grandfather's hands, like calloused, and him picking on me. Uh, you weren't worthy of being called by your real name until you were 18 in his eyes, so I was always Greg. So he'd be like, there's Greg, boy didn't even know how to wield a hammer. So, um, you know, he'd say that to my mom, like, tell Greg to go get my, uh, my tools for me. So um, just remembering his hands and, like, the calluses, and he was a tough old Marine, but he loved me and my brothers fiercely. And being around that growing up, like, today people, people despise manual labor, and here's what I want to get us back to. Jesus did that. He he was not like a nice-smelling individual when you met him, okay? There's no indoor plumbing. It's the first century. That's why washing feet was such a big deal. If you walk around with no indoor plumbing, no sewage facilities, where do you think all that goes? And that's why people walked around, they get this stuff caked on their feet. This is a different world than ours. And Jesus was, for 30 years, can you imagine the, the one who knows and designed the structure of the molecules of the wood that he was sawing or hammering, still doing that? Still sawing away and hammering away. He knows in the mystery of the incarnation everything about wood, and yet he learned how to use a saw. I don't know how that works. But I've always wondered this, like after the resurrection, and Jesus' half-brothers becoming disciples, did they ever take people back to the houses he helped his dad build? 
You know, can you imagine what that would have been like? I mean, imagine if you were sitting around in ancient Israel and, and somebody goes, well, you know, our architect, you know, you're kind of talking about your new home and it's beautiful flat roof. And you could be the person who goes, yeah, well, God built my house, quite literally, okay? So I wondered about that, and I bring all of that up in service of saying, why do people write these books? Why, why is this so hard for us to grasp? Because for 30 years, Jesus waited. He waited. He lived a life of obscurity. God the Son, just like Joseph God the Son in these circumstances that do not look befitting for the king of the universe and the creator of all things become man. And he's content to labor and learn and live until God says to him, now is the time. And during those 30 years, Jesus experienced the full range of human emotions. He experienced the full range of of human temptation. He was never a sinner. He never sinned. And yet he's experienced all that. And his life pattern becomes ours as Christians. All of Jesus' waiting and preparation was to minister to others while he waited for his coming glory. And in union with him, his people, his church now, As one author put it, we're engaged in the waiting service of the church of Jesus. We're waiting for the return of Christ. We're serving while we do that. That's what Joseph did. That's what Jesus did. Waiting. To quote the great theologian Tom Petty, the waiting is the hardest part, isn't it? Right? Okay, that's that's where we are. That's where we live. We live in a time of waiting. And we will never wait well or use our suffering as a form of evangelism until we get to where Joseph was with Jesus. Because the scriptures tell us Joseph looked ahead, and we'll come to this in chapter 50, and he says to his descendants, take my bones with you. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews 11 records this, that Joseph saw the coming resurrection. He saw Jesus in shadows and in types, but saw him. And I think one of the reasons Joseph could wait is because when he felt seemingly abandoned, he knew there would come a day when the one from the tribes of Israel, he didn't know exactly when, or who that person would be, or which tribe he would come from at this point. But he could wait because he knew that that coming one would be abandoned when Joseph wasn't. Joseph was seemingly abandoned by God. God gives him the interpretations. He encourages his faith. Jesus really was abandoned. And when he's on the cross... The father turns his face away, as our hymn puts it. And and Jesus cries out, Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And friends, that's the last time a psalm of lament is either referenced by direct or indirect um, implication in the entire New Testament. Think about that. Last time a psalm of lament is mentioned in the New Testament is when Jesus is on The cross. Why is that? Because Jesus is in our place being abandoned by God and simultaneously transforming all the laments of all of God's people throughout all the ages recorded in Scripture into a new song. He's put a new song in my mouth, the psalmist says, and Jesus' new song is this for us. I will be abandoned so that you never will be. I will lament Psalm 22, 1 in your place so that when you feel abandoned, you will know you never truly are abandoned because I took that upon myself. I experienced the the racking darkness. I experienced the loneliness for the first time ever of my father turning his face away for you so that you and I would never know that. And that's what Joseph saw by faith. While he waits, he trusts. While Jesus waits, he trusts. 
and in union with him while we wait, while we suffer, we trust and serve. Let me say a couple things and then we've got to finish up here. Um, what does all this mean for us today here in 2024? When the world forgets, God remembers you. Just as brothers had forgotten about him, we'll see that part of the story. Uh, you may feel just totally not seen. That's the way we put it today, right? I feel seen or I don't feel seen. I feel heard or I don't feel heard. You may feel like that, and here's the thing. One of the beautiful truths of the gospel is this, that God forgets your sins because of Jesus, but he always knows you. He always remembers you. He always sees all of us, doesn't he? And if you're a Christian, that should be one of the most comforting things in the world because it means that there's nobody in this room that does not matter. It means there's nobody in this room that God does not see and know down to the depths of our souls. And that should be an encouraging thing because God is interested passionately, as it were, about your day-to-day -day life. He knows everything he's ordained for you. What did David say? All my days were written in your book when there was as yet one of them. All the things that you're going to go through, the things I'm going to go through, all the suffering, all the waiting, all the mysterious, inexplicable, bewildering providences of God in our lives, he knows. And when the world may forget us or not know our name, God still knows us. He never abandons us. You may feel abandoned, not downplaying that. One of the things we have to do when we feel so alone and feel so distant from God is to realize he has not abandoned us because of what we've learned about Jesus on the cross. You've probably heard the expression, um, don't forget in the darkness what God showed you in the light. You know, what you're learning about God right now that's going to be the, the storehouse, as it were, when, when life's hard hits your life, when it comes to you. That's where, what Joseph had begun to learn is he knew this God who gave him the dreams hadn't given up on him. And that's what sustained our Savior through Gethsemane and onto the cross as he knew what his father was going to do. And how much more for us who live on the other side of the cross with the full revelation of the New Testament, knowing what God's going to do for us, what he's promised for us. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the mind of man the things that God has promised to those who love him. Isn't that what Paul tells us? Isn't that what we're to look for in faith? So how do we keep going when God seems absent? Here's one thing to consider. God is leaving you and me where we are if we're in a place that's of discomfort or pain or bewilderment. He's leaving us where we are to show us more about who he is. And you can't have the one without the other. He's got to keep you where you are till you and I get to know him as he is in the way he needs us to know him in order to use us the way he wants to use us. And so one of the ways we do that is by whenever the, the hard of life hits, coming back to the sovereignty that this was ordained. We don't freak out. We don't flip out. We don't flee. We don't fight. We say, God this was ordained. I don't understand. I know you hear me. I know you understand my pain. I know Jesus took your abandonment in my place for me. And we cry out to him that way. And then one of the hardest things to do is we're learning who God is, where he's leaving us, is accepting the trials he sends as an invitation to know Jesus better. So the moment that you and I pray and say, Lord, I want to get to know you better, it gets hard. So if anybody said to you that, um, I know this has not ever been a message in this church because I know your pastor is well enough, but you've, ever, you've heard it in popular preaching and teaching, you know, hey, come to Jesus and, and things are going to get better for you. You'll have this abundant life. That is true. That is true. I want to say that you get abundant life, but guess what Jesus told us with that abundant life? Houses, lands, fathers, brothers, and persecutions, he tells us. Suffering. 
You'll get all the, you're going to inherit the world, Paul says. You're going to inherit the, all of the earth belongs to the saints. That's what the, the Bible tells us. But in the meantime, until Jesus returns, all of it's going to be hard because this is a cursed world we live in. And when you feel abandoned by God, when you feel alone, it's that there and then when the trials are upon us that we have to see it's an invitation from God to say, if you really want to know my son, you've got to go where he went. You've got to follow in his footsteps. And his life pattern was suffering and then glory. Good Friday, then Easter Sunday. That life pattern is going to be the same for all who are in union with him. That means there's preordained hardness, hardship in all of our lives that God is going to use. And then the last thing, remember that God gets the glory when we suffer well in our disappointments. We never know what what God's going to use our witness for, do we? You may have a friend who who knows a little bit about your story. You may be in a hard place. And as you go on with the Lord, you don't know what God's going to use your suffering as a form of evangelism in that friend's life for. We don't understand. We can't see the whole picture. That's why it's so hard. And one of the things God at least is up to is saying, I will get the glory for my great name as I lead you through this time. I was thinking about the story of um, Hudson Taylor when I was preparing this. Um, Y'all may know him. He's the China Inland Mission, one of the great missionaries of the modern era, of any era. But what you may not know is after he started the China China Inland Mission, he was forced to return back to his sending, his place of origin, uh, East London, where he was sent from. Uh, He was poor at this time. He was sick. And his early supporters just seemed to be nowhere to be found. It's like, where are they? And he's had to spend about five years there in East London, wondering what God was doing. He had this amazing start to this mission, and now he was stranded back in London. And thinking like, what are you doing, God? And here's what he said. Without those hidden years, with all their growth and testing, How could the vision and enthusiasm of youth have been matured for the leadership that was to be? Isn't that an amazing perspective by this this man so used greatly of God? He says, "I'm, I'm this youthful guy, had this enthusiasm, and I needed this time in order to prepare me for what was coming next. Or as a friend of mine put it to me recently, Show me a person who has not been to the desert, and I will show you a Christian who is a fraud. God brings us to the desert, to the wilderness, to the place of prison and waiting. He'll bring us to this obscurity like he did for Jesus and then for Hudson Taylor in order to form us into the people we need to be to be used by him. So as one commentator put it, Delay never thwarts God's purposes. It only polishes his instruments. That's what he's doing in our lives right now. The the delay, the waiting is not thwarting his purposes. It's polishing you and I into a bright, shiny weapon in the hand of the Almighty. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you did give us stories here in the Old Testament. We thank you for the great story of the gospel, of Jesus who loves us and gave himself for us. Father, teach us, oh teach us, Lord, what it means to wait. And in the waiting, which is so hard, let us look to you by faith, Lord Jesus. Help us, give us the faith that Joseph had, and even more so because we live on the other side of the cross. Let us see your gentleness will make us great. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. Thanks, sir. Thanks so much, Dr. Fleur.
We're going to have our longer morning break at this time, so we've got a couple things to remind you of. There are, again, there's lots of books left here. There's plenty of snacks and refreshments in the hallway, uh, but also if you have questions, we have question cards. We'll collect those throughout the day. We'll have a basket up front here, but grab a three by five card if you have a question. If you want to uh, dig in later, we'll have a moderated Q&A session and we get to pick Dr. Fleur's brain about these topics. So uh, enjoy, your, enjoy your break. We'll be back here at 11.15. Justice satisfied. 